Welcome. This is Poets in Conversation. I'm Phyllis Klein. And let me start tonight by saying there are so many wars and armed conflicts going on in the world today as I speak that it would take all of our time and more to even mention them along with the numbers of fatalities. We are heart sick, we are divided, and poetry brings us together. Thanks for being here. Tonight, I welcome Richard Forrester and Anastasia Vassos, friends with prolific pens. Richard, master poet who in his latest book, which is his ninth, with little light and sometimes none at all, reveals to us his yearnings for transcendence from the darkness of the past. The book tells us about actual objects, talismans he has kept reminding him of past events, and spiritual objects like birds, dolphins, trees, and keys that show up in surprising ways for the author and again for the reader. Every facet of the poems, their words, worlds, lines, placement in the book, the chapters, prelude and postlude are all meticulously put into place, bringing a world of treasure for the reader to discover with delight. Anastasia Vassos, in her chapbook Nostos, tells, uses tales of ancient Greece as her guide into modern life. Like Richard, her poems are fine jewels, sparkled down to their essences, seasoned with surprising images, which we all wish we could have written. She speaks three languages, using her fluency in Greek as an, as, as an underpinning that bridges the modern with the ancient. She talks to us about faith, trying to figure out what it means. Is it God in the grocery store? Is it etymology? Is it cooking the recipes of her mother and her mother's mother? So I want to just tell you a little bit about the themes that we might touch on tonight. There's too many for us to go into in depth, but just wanted to give you an overview. So here's a list I have, and Richard Nan can add to this, of course. Mythology, family and faith, paganism and religions, heritages, including children of immigrants, which many of us in this room probably are, um, aging, which many of us in this room probably are, <laughs> and looking back. Um, so that's just an overview. And if you're interested in any of those, um, uh, please dig in and ask questions. And now I'm going to read my poem. And this poem is from a news story um, when the war in Ukraine started. Did the zoo animals think those bombs were monsters climbing out of subterranean dens, wakened by a fever, a virus, a warming, a curse? The lions could feel it in the air quite a while before it happened. It was the opposite of sound, but crept into the fur like a bee's stinger they could only thrash and growl at. When people stopped visiting, the gorilla got lonely. His eyes scanned empty paths for a sign, and the elephant couldn't sleep, its ears too big, the booms too vehement. Then the keepers relocated to the zoo and one slept with the elephant all night, like a mother elephant would have. Others read stories to the gorilla. There were babies launching out of wombs, same as always, because war doesn't stop nature, but food supplies dwindled, stomachs rumbled. Babies were terrified. The president said life will win over death and light will win over darkness. But the monsters couldn't stop their roaring through land and air. A mother lemur took it out on her daughter, who almost failed to thrive. And the bears, hungry, angry, started dreaming about escape more than ever before. 
As the rubble thickened, everyone shivered, and most songs stopped, except for every once in a while, one of the cranes rattled its bugle as a protest or a declaration of something so profound there was no translation into human. So let me introduce Anne. Thank you, Phyllis. You're welcome, Anne. My friend and amazing poet, Anastasia Vassos, lives in Boston. Her poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, Best of the Net, and Best New Poets. She is the author of Nostos, from Kelsey Books, and Nike Adjusting Her Sandal from Nix's Mate, and that was in 2021. Find her work in Rhino, Whale Road Review, Thrush, Comstock Review, Lily Poetry Review, and many other places. She speaks three languages. In addition to writing, her passion is cycling. And I should say the three languages are English, uh, Greek, and I think French, you'll have to see, see if I'm right on that. Yeah. <laughs> her passion is cycling. Over the past 18 years, she has cycled her way to raising nearly $100,000 for stem cell research at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. So welcome, Anne. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction, Phyllis. Um, I want to thank Phyllis and Len both for uh, hosting us this evening. It's, we have a beautiful group of people, and I'm real happy to be here reading with you. My first poem is, uh, well, no, I'm going to um, I'm going to read from Nike Adjusting Her Sandal, and then I'll read a couple of new poems, and then I'll read from the new book, Nostos. First poem is on Thera. Um, Thera is an island in the Aegean. Uh, that we know as Santorini, but the Greeks have two names sometimes for some of their islands. So for example, um, the island of Lesbos, the Greeks know as Mytilini. And um, uh, as I said, uh, we know Santorini, but the Greeks call it Thera. And the, um, the myth about Thera is that it's the lost island of Atlantis. On Thera, on this white island ringed in blue and dust, we climbed ghost steps leading up out of the cauldron. You and I are Greeks today, pretending we're on the surface of the moon. A widow dressed in black guards the church. Here at the edge of the Aegean, she tells us there's more wine than water, more churches than houses, more donkeys than people. Feed me a country that curves rogue waves round its edge, then returns them. I thirst, I hunger. Baffled crater, caldera, calderia. Language laces my Greek tongue with the lips of a Spaniard. We're at the hem of the volcano. I lift my dress, the breeze on my legs. Prodigal daughter. He stood, poured his tea from one cup to another to cool so he could drink it before he walked to the corner of the street to catch a bus that took him to the train to walk another block to catch another bus and then walk to his store so that my sister and I could go to college. I paid my father back by telling him I didn't believe in God. That was the summer I memorized Yates as I rode the train to work in town. I stared at the outlines of trees against the sky's coat. He called me princess. He faltered onto the chair next to the phone on the wall. He said, that's a sin, you know, and I, in my know-it-allness, with my college education, was indifferent until my mother told me how he had wept. I had been thinking about Petrarch and sonnets and that I had just run out of cigarettes. Um, 
The next poem is a epistolary poem, a letter poem that's addressed to um, the man who was the priest in uh, the Greek Orthodox Church where I grew up. Uh, and he died uh, just about a year ago. Um, he was my family's best friend for 50 years. Letter to Peter the priest as he awaits the day of judgment. If you see Aunt Helen, tell her I still have the gold hoop earrings. If you see my parents, tell them I'm sorry. My spine has herniated its disc and I wake in the middle of the night, askew. I wear socks to bed. But why am I telling the dead something they already know? Show me the profile of Jesus on this morning's burnt toast, the Facebook post of the horse you rode in on, the boat that carried you out. Show me the coffee grounds at the bottom of the cup, prophesy my future. The long journey through the mountains, a stranger I'll meet who'll bestow a gift. In the Alaskan rainforest, my friend Misty cared for her dying father who kept smoking, even as he lay in the unmade bed. After he died, he sent her a crown of sonnets. I won't ask if God exists, so I'm curious. When I pray, I'll name you instead, dear Petros, dear Rock. Yes, I believe naming is praying. Though you once said you are not a man of faith, I think that was just the blink of your eye, your hands and heart witnesses that Christ died for you. Tell me about the afterlife. Do you still wear the collar, those shiny clerical robes? Do you even have a body? Have you met St. Demetrius? Find out if St. George is still slaying the dragon, his horse bucking under him. Here in Boston, winter has slid into habit, hurling rain and shadow, shadow and rain instead of snow. The virus lingers, mutates. I'm left with the lamentation of the sky. I'm left with two gold coins I forgot to place on your eyelids when you fled. Tell me, is there really a river? Letter to the driver of the white SUV that killed a crow. You scared the shit out of me. You swerved so fast and close, the wind you dragged displacing me. Tell me how many times you've blown past 60 in this 30 mile per hour stretch. It was you last week when I was out riding my bicycle, you and your two ton salt stained vehicle. You saw it too that sleek, smart crow, once alive with squawk and fury, maybe a branch in its beak as it lifted off the road, making its way to build a nest, now a pile of blood, feathers, mangled marrow in the middle of the road. Have you picked out the feathers stuck in the cracks of your windshield? Here at my desk, I hear the thump again, feel the jump when you didn't slow down. I can tell you how smart the glossy Corvus can be. That crow could have picked you out in a crowd, used a tool to poke your eye out, then flown to the nearest tree to wait with the rest of his murder. I wish I could see him now, past the orange roses, past the clear glass vase. This poem was recently, um, uh, will be published any moment in Salem State University's Soundings East, uh, literary journal and they were nice enough to um knowing that this uh, meeting would be recorded to let me to let me read it the sun shines through the venetian blinds instead of listening to news of the war g puts on music to paint by the scene of the main sunset he took a photo of last summer the sun drops onto the dining room table where I write. When my phone lights up, it's Kristen in Kalamazoo texting me that her daughter-in-law's parents have fled Kiev to Zanzibar, that the children's hospital where Natasha saved other lives has been bombed. This small world verging on world war when we thought world war is no longer possible. I pick up the phone to call Kristen. She tells me her daughter-in-law has wept and wept for her parents. 
for their safety, almost sadder than death. I want to believe there is life after death, that the good guys will win. The sun detonates through the south facing window on this last day of February, and the blasts in that far away country do not discriminate. It might be us, civilians under siege, sleeping in subway stations. Here, the sun keeps bombing. Here's what I want you to know. The sun, as I sit facing the window, explodes into my eyes as it sets. If I move my head, I won't be blinded. So um, uh, I'm going to turn to Nostos. And thank you to my husband, Gary Keppel, for the cover. <laughs> um, Nostos means homecoming in Greek, and we first encountered the word in the Odyssey when Odysseus was trying to get home. It's the root of the word nostalgia. The lesser known riddle of the Sphinx. There are two sisters. One gives birth to the other. She, in turn, gives birth to the first. Who are the sisters? Call me the three-legged sister. In a pride of lions, the hunters are female. They kill their prey by strangulation. Sphinx from the Greek for squeeze, for anything that binds tight. Sphinx, head of a woman, immense, body of a lion, wings of a bird. We were small. We chased each other around the yard, day and night. Um, this next poem uh, has a word in it called, uh, the word is koliva, and it's a type of morning food, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, morning food that's um, made with wheat and raisins, currants, um, that's presented uh, at a memorial service for the dead. Um, and it begins with a, a, an epigraph from St. John 1224. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it dies. It remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The barrow. The earth is settling. It's been over a year and still no headstone to interrupt the earth's icy crust. The guise of the sun hits the heap of dust. I haven't eaten and I hunger. Before she died, she craved oysters baked in rock salt, the succulent tongues sheltered mute, the shells stacked on a cracked blue plate. The antique Greeks tied adjectives to noun, small coin to name koliva, the mournful food they bartered to keep alive their dead, an odd treat that mixes bitter and sweet. I can see the recipe in mother's hand. Boiled wheat berries, parsley, yellow raisins, sesame seeds. Amass the koliva in the shape of a burial mound on a platter. Sesame seeds, sesame seeds on top. Keep the final coat of sugar from melting into the mound. Some recipes call for pomegranates when they're in season. I add six, just in case. The next poem is titled In Kavala. And um, Kavala is a resort town in Northern Greece near Thessaloniki. In Kavala. Fresh peaches eaten on the beach, more juice than pulp, orange and yellow, my chin, the air, eggplant, tomato sandwiches, the Aegean, mussels we peeled off the bold sunbathing rock, knifing them open squeezing lemon while salt tightened our skin. My gold baptismal cross lost at the boulder's base, then found, then lost a second time. Dear God, I saw you today in the grocery store stacking pomegranates. I recognized your dreadlocks. I saw you holding my American Heritage Dictionary, page 48, searching all the words with Greek roots. 
There you were in the maple trees' phalanges, the blaring canopy grounded, wet leaves in the grass stunted by November's cheek. At 4 a.m., you appeared behind my eyelids in the shape of a boat. Was that on purpose? Struts, struts and joints and ribs and stretchers almost shining. Thank you for my body. Thank you for listening to my babbling until an hour before dark. In the park, the Orthodox priest passes floating on his cloud of faith, his black cassock, his cylindrical hat long and tall. I wipe dust off my shoe. I thought that was you in the soot on my finger after I passed it through the candle flame. Dear God, when you see me eating in church, it's because I hunger. Two more poems. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, I read uh, a poet the other day who said that a poem is unfinished until it's read or heard by someone else. And so I just wanted to say thank you for helping me complete my poems. Etymology. The leaves undersides fluoresce silver as I cycle past. The air is full of sentiment. I see that silver green curling everywhere. No one sees me down this road. Cycle from Latin cyclus, from Greek kiklos, circle of time, when phenomena echo back to us. Morning silence whistles into me. Carbon, steel circulate under bone and muscle. Last night, I promised to pray for a stranger's husband. What do I know about speaking to God? I wear a mask. What do I know? And I'll uh, finish by reading the title poem of the book, Nostos. Bird circle, rich entertainment, and the middle of it, nature not quite dead. The sun's blade makes one last stab across my back. I am leaving you, October of my grieving, your gray head, your orange skirt flouncing round your ankles. I drive east in low gear along the unmuscled arm of Ohio, heading toward November. And as the sun falls behind me, trees huddle to mask disaster. Darkness, unwelcome, takes over the sky. I thank the stars for making a colander of night. I look up and ahead through heaven's perforation. The landscape shrivels past. I am Orpheus in a dress, Eurydice blind. I drive under the overpass. Lights strain, headlights on the bridge gleam like the eye in the head of an oracle. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was amazing reading. <laughs> wow. Let me ask Richard to come and join us too. And uh, I thought I saw somebody's hand raised, but I think that might have been a, mis a mistake. Um, so I do invite you if you want it, if you want to talk during this interlude, please do um, raise your virtual hand. And in the meantime, I will get us started um, by saying to you, Anne, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I tried to make a little bit of a list of um, um, some of the images that you use, which kind of blow my mind and memorable lines. Um, so let's see. So, and I hope that, um, so the first one is here in Boston, winter has slid into habit, hurling mm -hmm. rain and shadow, shadow and rain instead of snow. Um, winter has slid into habit. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the second one, that sleek, smart crow, once alive with juice and squawk and fury. 
I, I had to just write the whole thing down. I can tell you how smart that glossy Corvus can be. That throw crow could have picked you out in a crowd, used a tool to poke your eye out, <laughs> then flown to the nearest tree to wait with the rest of his murder. I mean, a murder of crows never done that well. And then all the I hungers. I think I counted yeah. three three I hungers. Yeah. Which I yeah, just, I noticed that too. <laughs> I'm sorry. I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah, which you know, I love when something's repeated like that, and um, you know, hungering is a is a really good thing to yeah um, to be writing about. Um, and then the last one, there are many, many more. Um, just uh, um, wet leaves and grass stunted by November's cheek. <laughs> when you see me eating in church, it's because I hunger. So yeah, those are the ones that that I wanted to mention. And I, Richard, I wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to. Well, ask. the hunger um, stood out for me, and and it didn't annoy me because it's the hungering for God, it's the hungering for a uh, home, uh, hungering for reconciliation with parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. And uh, also what struck me are the, the oysters, the, all the food you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's difficult to do, I think, in, in poetry to do it well. And okay. uh, But I was starting to salivate a little bit over that. <laughs> and funny, I, 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 I know that Richard uh, is an oyster lover. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. So yeah, and interesting that you're writing about food and the richness of food and cooking at the same time being so hungry. I love that just just a position. Well, and also that sense of of mourning, right? I mean, I know that when like when my parents passed away or someone close to you passes away, what do you want? You want to drink and you want to eat. You know, um, it it's kind of like to fill the fill an emptiness or yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So you're starting to answer my question if you have any more about uh, hunger, like what it what it represents for you and the you know, and how it shows up so many times. And so, you know, I, I imagine there's a lot there. Is there anything well, else you can think of? I guess I guess the thing about hunger as a metaphor is that it also has to do with searching and with wanting to um, express what's in what's inside of a person, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and so writing it down. Well, this is how I feel is one thing, but making it into a poem is something entirely different. And so that kind of it's it's more a uh, I hunger, I search, I am looking, I'm holding up, I'm holding up my lamp um so that's sort of what i um what i mean a lot and a lot of it has to do with that searching for 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 faith i mean i grew up in the greek orthodox church and even though that's not part of my um spiritual life anymore um metaphorically it certainly is mm -hmm. you know um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah. yeah it certainly has a lot of symbolism right and uh, not that I, I've been, I think, once, I think, actually, yeah, to a Greek Orthodox church. And there's so many smells and implements and the vest, <laughs> all the, the the clothes. And right. so it probably has a lot of like core memories for you, would you say? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah very much. And, you know, that was ancient Greek. And those ancient Greek prayers were the first Greek I learned, um, uh -huh. in, in addition to speaking Greek in our in our home, but it was, it was the first it was the first poetry I was, I was exposed to, so. Uh -huh. So I see Peter yeah. has a question. Yeah, Peter, come on in. Thanks for raising your hand. Thank you. Um, so, uh, just to go back to what you were saying, Phyllis, about the. Uh, the smells and the garments, and I mean, the, 
Greek life is very sensory. It's very sensual, not necessarily in a sexual sense, but but very mm-hmm. attuned to the senses, mm-hmm. and and you find that in 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 the religious context as well. So I I um, I'm not surprised to find that in your poetry in SSC. Yeah, it's beautiful, Thank uh, you. but it's very much part of of the experience of of growing up in a Greek environment. Yeah. Uh, not only in the church, but in the household as well. I mean, the foods and scents and sounds are, are very much part of um, that culture. Yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. It's it's lovely to to see how you, you blend your worlds. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, yeah. One more thing that I can ask you, Anne, now, and then we'll go on to Richard, is um, so um, your poem, your Nostos, which is such an amazing mm-hmm. poem. All of the poems are amazing. That one um, certainly meets that standard. Um, so I was wondering if you want to uh, talk, th- talk us through a little bit of the mythology in there, um, because... Um, you know, that's one of the things I know that's really, really important to you in your poetry. Yeah. I know it's really important to Richard as well. And, well, um, you know, um, the legend of Orpheus and Eurydice, Eurydice mm-hmm. um, was a, uh, the daughter of, help me out, Richard, was the daughter of, <laughs> what's I her name? I can't help you. I... <laughs> oh, no, I can't help the you. The nature goddess. Um, anyways, she was stolen by Hades, and uh, um, oh, I'm getting that mixed up. You're getting it mixed up with Persephone. I'm getting it mixed up with Persephone. No, I don't feel so bad, right? No, 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 no. Orpheus and Eurydice. (laughs) Eurydice dies, she goes to Hades, and Orpheus is beside himself, and so he goes to, he goes to, um, uh, down to Hades to, to get her back. And is he the, the one that sings? Does he have a beautiful voice? Yes. Or is that... and so, yeah. Okay. And so, um, and so, uh, the king of the underworld says, "Well, you can have her back. She'll follow you up." But you, as long um, as you can't turn around and look at her, that's it. See, I did know it. I saw an opera. That's how I knew about it. That's, yeah. that's it. All right. Well, excuse me, everybody, for getting my Greek myths <laughs> mixed up. It makes um, us all feel a little better about it, you know. Yeah, and so for me, it's that sense of, you know, in in this poem, I'm leaving Ohio and I'm coming back to Boston, right? Mm-hmm. But that's sort of like what's happening on, on a narrative level, and so mm-hmm. there's this. You know, you're going home, but you're leaving home, and you don't want you want to look back, but you don't want to look back, and so all of that is mixed mixed up in in um, becomes part of the poem. So that's, that was the uh, yeah. Well, wow, that's so. I love hearing you talk about that because it just deepens the poem so much. And oh, thank you. I know, yeah, I mean, I know that we we would find that out by remembering. Yeah. Um, that that story but um and yeah and then the end um the light strain uh, headlights on the bridge gleam like the eye and the head of an oracle yeah so you're leaving us with this image of um what would you say like is an oracle um sort of awesome. third on. yeah is it is it scary is it awesome is it you tell me you tell me Phyllis I can't answer that question okay all right just just, that's how it makes how it makes you feel right okay right yeah Yeah. however however maybe all of the above right okay yeah just beautiful yeah thank Thank you you. Peter yeah one more question and then um yeah well I I just wanted to say the um the connotation of nostos in 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 the Greek psyche is is very much there's a connotation of yearning and it links very beautifully with your your use of uh i hunger mm-hmm. um, so those dovetail really nicely together thank you thank you beautiful yeah yeah and yeah for me the hunger is also um the longing i, I just mm-hmm. feel it feels very um uh you know the the longing for connection um longing for love, maybe longing 
for repair of things that haven't gone so well. There's just so many different ways, different metaphorical levels, different ways to think about it. So, um, and we're getting a lot of comments in the chat here about how um, uh, how everybody looked, had just enjoyed so much. Um, you're reading, Anne. So, um, yeah, Christine, thanks you for sharing your wonderful poems. Maggie says, uh, thank you for taking us on a journey. Elise says, what a lovely reading and glorious poems. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, Sandy has a question. Is it Gaia? So I'm not sure. Um, is that about, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, I don't know, Sandy, if you want to elaborate a little more. Well, I was just wondering if um, the, the nature goddess you were referring to. Oh, Demeter. Demeter. Um, Gaia is uh, the original Earth Mother. <laughs> yeah. Mm, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Okay. Well, Anne, Thank I'll you. be back to you. Yeah. And now I'm going to introduce Richard. Um, and we're in for more. Um, what shall I say? Metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> At the very least, we're in for some astonishing poetry. Um, so, Richard Forster's eighth book, Boy on a Doorstep, New and Selected Poems from Tiger Bark Press, received the 2020 Poetry by the Sea Book Award. And his new collection, uh, with little light and sometimes none at all, is from literal books in this of, of 2023. He has many honors, including Discovery, the Nation Award, Poetry Magazine's Best Hoken Prize, the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Scholarship, and two National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Fellowships. Since the late 1970s, his work has appeared widely in magazines and anthologies, uh, such as Best American Poetry, Kenyon Review, Tri-Quarterly, the Gettysburg Review, Boulevard, the Southern Review, and Poetry. And Richard lives in a hundred-year-old former church in Elliott, Maine. And I would just really want to see that sometime. Um, if I can ever get back out in the world like that. And I did also want to give a shout out to Richard's partner, Douglas Taylor, who did all the amazing artwork in the book. And I have some questions about that that I can ask you later. So so my friend Richard, which um, please, um, please take it away. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for the invitation. And, and thank you, Anastasia, for that wonderful reading. I, I, um, delighted to be here and and I see that there are about 29 30 people so thank you all for for tuning in um I want to start with this poem because uh, today is Holocaust Memorial Day um this poem appeared in poetry 30 years ago and uh sadly it's it's still timely uh, it's called the failure of similes in one image of the camps, the snow sifts down like lime, or should it be the other way around? Mere words now tumble like corpses, like windy sacks in which the soul once sang. You might have heard them somewhere before they bloated in those earthen wounds, and still we pile them higher and curse the stench that rises from the cargo hold of history. Why can't we close that gash? Oh, Adonai, some shouted. It should have rung the sky of color. And now Allah, Allah, all the names empty toward heaven as tongues blister in the flames. Here's a poem that opens uh, the new collection. Um, it's called Aspens, the trees. And um, it's about weather of all sorts, the, the outside weather, uh, the storms, uh, the storms that rage around the world and also within us. Last night, the fool in me waking, as if half drunk, wanted to dance when the wind came up, insistent as surf, 
and lofted my bedroom window shears like veils about my shoulders. A wish, a whoosh, a clacking like castanets moved through the limbs of the aspens that border my lawn, had set them dervishing, the whole congregation moonlit on tiptoes, as if in frenzied praise of a god made manifest riding on a sweep of wind. And I felt certain the aspens would endure again the quaking current of that ecstasy. In light, it's hard not to believe optimism is just stubborn pretense. This morning, three trees lay felled, the roots exposed like hacked bones in opened graves. I've stood before in the stillness of afterstorm, the everywhereness of it, among litter strewn from far corners of my brain, the stutter and static of news, brittling green torn from cliches of hope and tides of war and brewing storm, and stared into a wreckage of words left abandoned on the page, as if I'd never been that god of weather. And so I wield again the grumbling bite of a chainsaw. I'll make neat cords of nuisance. I'll hitch the stumps to a truck and yank them out, easy as teeth, easy as taking a rake to smooth over what's past, tamp it flat with my muck boots in a foolish dance. Of course, it's never as easy as that. Uh, this next poem is called A Pot of Crocuses. And it delves into uh, various aspects of, of mythology that I love. This one uh, references um, Adonis, that, that demigod who went out hunting, was gored by a, a boar, and his blood fell into the earth. And the next spring, because of Aphrodite's prayers, uh, comes back as a blood red uh, anemone flower. Um, in real ancient Greek time, um, the women of Athens uh, used to celebrate uh, the death and resurrection of Adonis with a festival in which they took broken shards of, of pottery and would force uh, lettuce and fennel seeds, put the, the shards up on the rooftops where they would sprout and then wilt to be gathered up and then there would be the, the religious festival. Uh, now, zoom forward um, more than two millennia, and here I am um, with a crocus pot forcing crocus uh, corns. Uh, a pot of crocuses. The weathered crocus pot, which I coddle each winter under salt marsh hay, again commands its center stage in my kitchen window. In terraced beds, the corms pro poke through the soil like randy waking gods, their pale phalluses swelling in the sun. All morning I reveled in the comfort of ancient ritual, till my neighbor's scab-kneed boy on Easter break began to trundle up and down the street on his skateboard, trying to gain the necessary speed that could spring-load him into air as if in that moment he would escape once and for all the tedious maze of his adolescence and return perfect and unbloodied to an earth remade invincible with flowers. So I watched in secret and found myself urging him on, but soon he slouched off with raw abraded palms toward home. And I felt I needed to call him back, my not quite budding Adonis but could see on the asphalt beneath my window the small red stains from his hands. And I wanted to say, here, take these crocuses to your mother, so she might forgive the scarring a woman has to endure to see a boy safely to manhood. Instead, I stood there, wavering, with that crowded pot of spikes in my hands, and knew if I had summoned him, it wouldn't have been for any promise of beauty I had to offer, nor any incorruptible idea of it, nor even the cherished terracotta I buried and retrieved these 15 years. For how could I have looked him in the eyes, not knowing which of these must end up broken first?
um, in this similar vein, here is um, the speaker, my persona, the me and not me of the poem, um, engaging with a young man in a supermarket. Um, I'm, I'm generally not as cranky as, as the speaker in this poem. Watercress begins with an epigraph from Wallace Stevens. To pick a crisp salad from the garbage of the past is no snap. Did you find everything you were looking for? The teen at the checkout asked as he scanned the groupings I'd arranged on the belt. No, I said, looking deep into his earnest face. 16 perhaps with lashes like a Pasha's fan and the downy bloom of a first beard. He tightened his brow with concern, making golden threads in his green eyes unapproachably alluring. No fault of his, still I complained, the market doesn't stock watercress, which I consider essential for salads with Boston and Romaine. What's watercress? He was too young to appreciate the nourishing appeal of bitterness, a taste admittedly at odds with youthful cravings, yet one a man acquires almost in defiance to ingest the biting world and not succumb to its poisons. The boy nodded and smiled, all the while deconstructing my neat piles for reassembly in some adolescent application of chaos theory. A half century his senior, childless, and lacking necessary morsels of wisdom a parent needs to nurture with neglect and let inexperience stumble on its way. I watched my canvas sacks begin to brim with disorder, eggs wedged in with canned tomatoes, as if the boy were gathering my future there before him, raw ingredients of a harvested past, and I knew to hold my tongue. This poem is called Theme with Variation, and again, another mythological character comes back at the end, um, it's Icarus. Those cautionary childhood tales took on the truth of experience the day my hand was held to a stovetop's blistering blue. Even after a need to trust smoldered somewhere inside me, making it easy to be cajoled to thrust a hairpin into a socket less the shock than the jolt of laughter boomed at my ears like destiny, like my father's harangues steeped in a barroom brew of tease and threat, his via negativa to manhood. Never let them see you cry or else they'll call you. I'll confess to my share of bloodied noses to lips sputtering with resentment across the years, like a needle stuck in a record's groove. I thought of all those boys tonight as I listened to an LP of Sibelius's Fifth Symphony. I had to wipe clean a five decades dust when it skipped at my favorite part, where the winds begin to soar largamente, sun-drawn, into a sky without horizons, and I become the boy whose makeshift wings fueled the furious incandescence of his body. Even though it means in my embrace of him, I must fall each time into that brutal myth. That was theme with variation. This is the same theme with a different variation and another uh, mythological boy uh, appears um, and, and the one here is Ganymede um, and it begins with an epigraph in Latin uh, from Ovid's Metamorphoses, which I, I won't read, but it, it, it's roughly um, about Jove um, taking on the guise of an eagle. In the thundering flash of his wing disguise, he snatched the Trojan boy drift. It was May. Windows open. The sublimity of lilacs had arrived, commingling 
soundless as thought or touch, when I awoke hearing that great horned owl perched among the oak's lower limbs. At eye level, like an omen come to pose again its one cliched question. Past midnight, who else would care to see or hear? Both my parents went deaf, my mother blind, confined to the cabin of herself her last five years, and in other ways long before. So when I sensed his figure emerging from behind the staring eyes, I sat in the dark and turned the CD player on almost too low for me to hear the adagio of a favorite symphony, yet leave my love undisturbed in the half-empty bed. But there it was, palpable, despite the music, the memory of a touch tousling a sleeping boy's hair, synaptic black and static, his cry toward a distant room cut short. And when that music finally eased itself into silence, the blaring eyes again were gone, and I could hear not far a nestling gripped in the taloned hush of that raptor's wings, nothing more, and it seemed a blessing in which I was adrift. A few years back, um, we had um, a comet uh, called Neowise. I think it was like three, maybe four years ago in the summer. Um, the apparition, which I learned is what a comet is called that suddenly appears in the sky. Um, an epigraph from NASA. Comet Neowise will not return to the sun for another nearly 7,000 years. And uh, there are some allusions in here to the Bayou Tapestry um, and to that uh, suicide cult uh, known as Heaven's Gate, an apparition. Angel of ice, little arrow to the eye, easy to make of you everything you're not. Shuttlecock and cosmic wind, egret's plume in a pot of ink, old man's tuft of thinning hair. Whatever omen you ferry on your long ellipse, glimmered in Bronze Age skies. We know your kind. Heralds of plague and divine births, a Norman ordained to topple the Saxon from his steed, even an apocalyptic craft to whisk a worthy few through heaven's gate. Tonight I stood in an open field as far from others as I could reach held you steady as I was able, peered long through the lens that kept me enthralled till my muscles tremored, shook. And like a string that snapped on a child's balloon, I felt a part of me abandoned to the dark, those milky fires, the extinguishing distances where every intention evaporates. Earth's sweet damp snagged me back. The field had gemmed with citrine flashes, and from the encircling trees a guttural antiphony of frogs spilled out. Frantic black-winged hungers darted overhead. I had no need. A mist had risen from the ground. A mosquito hymned at my ear. And the last one. Um, this morning I finished reading the wonderful new translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses by um, Stephanie McCarter. And I had forgotten that it ends with Ovid um, in a tiny epilogue uh, predicting his own metamorphosis, his transformation. And as you would guess it, he predicted that he would become his book. And it, it, <laughs> I had already decided to read this poem last and um, isn't that what every artist wants to um, become his or her work? Um, this poem is called Angela. It's about my Tanta Angela, who was German but married to an Italian. And she taught me how to make um, spaghetti sauce and meatballs when I was probably 13. And there's an epigraph from Stanley Kunitz. Gradually, I'm changing to a word. And I allude to three very famous artists who 
or transformed. Entropy as trope, from tropos, a turning, as in flesh to grit, to smoke's billion particulates, into stratospheric blue, Giotto in the ground pigments he mortared into heaven, or sergeant embodied in the stroke of cadmium white on the guitar left floating in ghostly silence above a ruckus of flamenco, flamenco chords, or chilhuli and sold in the molten silicus cooling in the ephemeral bubble of breath held in the hard unforgetting. And as here, more modestly, in the gentle kneading of the five ingredients my aunt taught me were essential 60 years ago, in the ritual of rolling the assembled mixture in my hands before easing each proportioned orb into the blood red sauce, in the nourishing aroma that arose then, so diffuse, yet reclaimed in this, my small kitchen of ideas. It's the sort of afterlife I can't help but think she would have chosen for herself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was beautiful and so much for us to talk about. Um, and uh, I want to invite everybody to think of any questions that you might have or um, comments. And Bravo is coming up. Lots of uh, lines that you read. Lovely readings, wonderful. Um, wonderful. I shouldn't say that so flat. Wonderful. Yes. So <laughs> does anybody have a question or a comment that you want to raise your hand and ask about? Um, and if not, um, we could start with the three of us um, and see if there's anything that the two of you would like to talk about. I have that list of things that we had discussed beforehand about family and history. Um well, I have a, um, what always strikes me about Richard's work is that there's not a wasted word or a wasted image, mm -hmm. that everything is so carefully selected and there's a kind of mm, chewiness, if you will, to, to the work. Um, and I was wondering about if, <laughs> Richard, does your mind work that way? Or, I mean, for example, when I write a poem, sometimes um, like November's cheek, right? Sometimes like I'll use, a ver I'll use a noun or a verb and it will be a boring verb. And I'll try to think of something else that makes it a little more alive on the page. And hence came November's cheek in, in one of my poems. But how does that work? How does that work for you? Is that... Um, I'd love to know a little bit about your process and that relationship to, to words and imagery that's so rich and dense and beautiful. And if that just comes to you, is that part of like who you are or how, how do you work at it? Um, it's an amalgam of things. I, I grew up um, early on reading um, Edgar Allan Poe. And so there was a lot of musicality there. Um, then there was Emily Dickinson, that to this day I still you know, I'm challenged by trying to figure out what the hell she's talking about. Um, and then having gone to a Jesuit um, high school, um, we had a lot of, of Gerard Manley Hopkins. So there's the long um, sentences that go on. Um, my, my first job after graduate school was working for a dictionary company. And this is before computers. And we were doing a revision of the World Book Dictionary. And so over the course of three years, I got to read that dictionary and other dictionaries three times over um, as, as the, the additions were made, as things were cut out, as the long compositors, galleys would come in and have to be proofread and corrected and then proofread again. And I would make notes of, of words that, that interested me. 
Um, and as you and, and Phyllis well know, I revise, 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 and, and um, reshape and recast um, and our classes with Mark Doty certainly, you know, um, encourage that. Um, but yes, I love the sinuous um, syntax of, of poems. Um, I've been told sometimes the, the sentences are too long, they need to be simplified. And then, so I do go back. <laughs> I just, yeah, I listen to you, Anne. You know, <laughs> this is um, actually, yeah. I'm and, um, sorry to so that's yeah. I, I I love I love words. I I don't read music, but I listen to classical music all the time, and I want there to be music in my poems. So there's lots of clanging around of consonants and, and mm -hmm. assonants and internal rhymes. That there is, yeah. So yeah, I had some very similar along the same lines to ask you about, and let's bring Robert in. Robert, Richard and I said, thank you. It was a, a beautiful set of readings, um, and I actually have a very specific question for each of you that I wrote down as you were reading, um, and starting with Anastasia. Um, I, I know that you're very much into extreme sports, <laughs> and <laughs> and distance riding. <laughs> <laughs> and and in, in some of your poems, I actually had that experience of um, those images being placed on the on the bike of the uh, of the pushing of the body and observing through that experience. And I'm wondering if that's um, an accurate observation or if you have thoughts about the intersection of that part, those parts of your life. And, and Richard, um, hearing tonight's poems. Um, I was really struck by um, whether it was the bowl of crocuses or the comet or the grocery store checkout clerk, there was a very tender approach to the, it was almost a deification of innocence. And I just am wondering if that's a theme that, that uh, has um, played out in your work. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you for those questions. And first. Uh, well, um, yeah, I have a few poems about riding a bicycle. And, um, you know, your observation is astute. A lot of times those, um, how shall I say it, those understandings come through the effort of, of pushing the body through. Um, it's also interesting to me, this notion of, in terms of like, if, if you're writing a poem or if you're reading a poem to experience it through your body. Um, and sometimes what I try to remember is if I'm listening to a poem or reading a poem that I don't quite get, I try to see like where it is in my body that it's, it's affecting me. Um, so that is always, uh, well, I'm getting better at it. So it's not always at play, but I certainly is something that I try to, I try to be aware of. And it's fun to use, um, to use cycling as a metaphor. I have a few poems about that include that, that image, that metaphor of, of cycling. Um, <laughs> And that driver in the white SUV was something else. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you for ask, your question. I, I would want to ask, and um, wh while you're cycling, are you sometimes thinking of, of lines of poems and revising? Or um, that only happened. That only happened once. Usually, I'm like looking for potholes and being aware <laughs> of being aware of like uh, drivers and you know what's around me and stuff. It really is about it really is about that there's only one poem where i got an image and then i used it and then i used it in a poem so it's funny it's funny that you ask that mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i was thinking yeah just to add to what you're saying i was thinking that um there's a certain muscularity to poetry 
Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think, um, I don't know if I would say your poem is, your poetry is muscular, because it's, it's mm -hmm. so much more than that, but, um, but I, yeah, maybe some of the compaction that you've developed as you've gone along, and, and, and the, you know, the, the way that you put so much meaning into, you both yeah. do, you know, into, um, uh, sh you know, lines that um there's they're very um uh rich and deep um so i don't know if that fits with what you're saying also robert but to answer robert's question for me um yeah, yeah i try to me you know I, i'm gay young men are, are handsome and and you know um uh, unapproachably alluring uh, as I say in that one poem, but I do try to deal with the characters I put in these, um, you know, semi quasi narrative poems uh, um, to deal with uh, to deal with them tenderly, um, to reserve judgment, um, and to, to try to have compassion um, for them, um, and that. I think is part of my having not received that kind of love and compassion while I was growing up. And so, um, for example, in, in the, the poem about the, the boy at the checkout counter, you know, the, the, the portrait is more about the speaker th than the boy. And with um, the man looking out his window at, at the, the skateboarder, which never happened. I made the whole thing up. Um, but uh, dealing <clears throat> dealing with that, that exchange of there is the myth, there is the boy who goes down into the earth, there is, in effect, Jesus Christ coming back, you know, in, in, in all of these myths. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I just enjoyed weaving all that three, the mythological, the historical, and, and the current in, in that poem, and, and to do it with um, with wonder and compassion. Mm -hmm. And and that take, uh, in the stanza, it's take these crocuses and then stanza break to your mother. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of thing like, oh my God, what she must be going through when when you come home with your bloody hands <laughs> your scabby knees um yeah always that's a beautiful be, moment that's a beautiful moment in that always be, always be tender yeah yeah both done so beautifully thank you both thank, thank you. you thank you for your thank you robert and robert um you did such an amazing job with that interview of richard at the end of his book I really, really enjoy that so much. And it it helped a lot. Um, you know, after reading the poetry, it helped a lot to to read that. Um yeah. you know, so many interesting and and probing questions that uh and the answers were also really well done, Richard. So yeah, so if, if people do read the book, there is an interview at the end. Yeah, that's so um I wanna make sure that I say some of Richard's memorable lines that um just to just to be balanced about it that I wrote down and um I'm not sure you read this one Richard but the rubied slosh of the outgoing time no I, I, I didn't um yeah but I still uh, that's that the down. one I pulled that's the one I pulled from the um yeah you yeah, but I thought that was amazing. The rubied slosh of the outgoing tide into the night. It's a, a poem about, um, is it dolphins or whales that are getting, oh, killer whales, is it, that are getting no. slaughtered anyway? Yeah. Um, they're, they're pilot whales and dolphins. And, um, so the red in the water, yeah, whoa. And uh, then um, shuttlecock in cosmic wind. I can't remember where that came from, but. Um, that's from uh, an apparition. Okay, seismic um, clatter. Oh, this one was for your hand, actually, that you didn't read either. Seismic clatter it with a teacup on a on a saucer. That's such a great image of um, if your hand feels a little shaky. Um, and then on this one, the day my hand was held to a stovetop's blistering blue, like 
Whoa, that like the first line of that poem. I mean, I can still close my eyes and and picture the the kitchen in the Bronx where that was done to me. Well, I can feel it. It, it hurts. Yeah. I think we can all we can all feel it. Speaking of embodying embodiment and poetry. Um and I don't um and then the last one and then I'll go back to some, a, a wish a wish a clacking like castanets that um music you're talking about music yeah I think that also that, the music of the quaking aspens when you hear them in wind that they, they are yeah, yes, exactly. clacking away. Yeah <laughs> so and then I did want to ask you just a little bit about Doug's artwork um, in your book. So, and I can I can point it out. Um, here's one. So, the placement of the artwork is it? Um, it's this beautiful uh, painting, yeah. That that is uh, translucent. So so it. it um. I had nothing to do with the selection of the artwork. Um, uh -huh. Lori um, Harley, uh, who's the designer for Literal Books, um, went to Doug's website and pulled the the paintings. So I was surprised when I saw the page proofs, first proofs. Mm -hmm. There were Doug's. Oh, lovely, yeah. Yeah, um, it's such a beautiful addition to the book, yeah. It is, and and literal uh, littoral books, um, a small press in Portland, Maine. Um, the books are very, very handsome, and because I was admiring them, awesome. that's why I approached them to do my book. Yeah. So the the placement of the pictures is not connected to the poetry. It's kind of just where they decided to put them, or yes, yeah, yeah. yeah Richard and I are both lucky to be married to. Um... Artists? To visual artists, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I love being married to a painter and being able to talk about my poems in a way that he understands mm -hmm. through his process of painting. I'm sure you experience the same thing that with with Douglas Richard. And before we started today, I was in the church, the big room, and Doug is working on a show that's coming up and. Uh, working on a very large painting, four by five, of a winter scene. And uh, just <laughs> um, finishing it up. And it's it's so wonderful just to watch him, um, yeah. you know, a little bit here, a little bit here, and each day mm. it changes slightly. And I've been chronicling it on Facebook. Um, yeah. We're up to day 10 now. And he, he says he's finished. And, and it's just... The subtle changes in the thing, and it's it's revision in a way. It's like what happens. I was just going to say it. That's what you do. It's <laughs> what they, you know. Stroke is a word. The yeah. layering, yeah. right? It's yeah. the layering of the paint that is a lot like the way we take the poem and move, yeah. move the words around and layer it in different ways. So, and the yeah. turpentine can make it all disappear, like pushing the delete button. <laughs> yeah, that that's, that would be nice if that was going on in watercolor. Watercolors, I'm trying that out, and I don't. You can't really erase it. So, yeah. Anybody? Does anyone else have anything you want to say or a question? Um, uh, I'll just give you all a minute to think about it or a comment. Um, I mean, we heard some amazing, amazing poetry. So, if anything sticks in your mind that you want to ask about. Gary, yeah, please. Hi, uh, uh, Richard. Your your description of the young man at the checkout, uh, you know, and you're just and you describing your writing and uh, you know those uh, those feelings or observations and dealing with them respectfully and gently uh, <clears throat> really came across for me. Uh, you know, to put it in. Uh, you know, the eyes of me as a visual painter, it was almost like you were describing uh, a painting of, or, or, or a beautiful painting that, that you wanted to touch, but you know you weren't supposed to. <laughs> well, you've, you've been to the house, Gary. Um, there are a few of that young man's portraits hanging in the house. Oh, um, okay. Doug approached him uh, at Hannaford's in York, Maine, and said, would you come pose and did a whole series of, of um, 
photographs and then did um, mixed media using the photographs and mounting them on board and painting over them. Mm. And his name um, is Matthew. He's probably in his mid twenties now, mm -hmm. uh, was in York High School and wanted to become a playwright. And oh, nice. just a, a beautiful young man. He looked like something that mm. out of a, a Botticelli or a Fra Angelico mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I, I was, <laughs> I was describing a painting when I was putting him in that poem. Cool. Yeah. Oh, it's so lovely to hear some of the background and, you know, what, what you think and how you explain, talk a little bit about the poems. I, I find that so wonderful. Um, you know, when you're alone reading a book, that's also really beautiful because you're connecting with the poet and you're also connecting with yourself to try to figure out well how does it like Anne was saying well I can't really tell you what that means what how does what does it mean to you right so um um is there anyone else um okay yeah great Pat hi I, I just wanted to I'm fascinated by how poems get started. And I, I want to ask about the, the Crow poem and also about the the Botticelli poem, you know, the the the, the grocery store. Yeah, and 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 you you know, there may not be a story. There may not be any, you know, it may just be, I don't know, this stuff was hanging with me forever. But if if each of you could talk about the crow poem. And the body and the, the, the grocery um, checkout poem. What what when did it start? Was it was it a line? Was it an image? Was it whatever? So that's that's just that's what that's my question. Mm, thank you for that, Richard. You want to take it first? Uh, well, the watercress poem started actually with the, the questions that not that young man Matthew but you know what whatever checkout person is there they always say did you find everything you were looking for today and invariably <laughs> no <laughs> and so that's where that poem started and because Doug had been doing these portraits of 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 Matthew it, it just started to feel you know about this this divide between uh young people and, and uh, older generations where there is a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And um, one clerk did say, what's watercress? When, when you know, I respond, what's watercress? And, and, you know, a lot of adults don't know what watercress is, but I just thought, okay, this is how generations start drifting apart. And um, that poem ends with the, you know, that there's the boy, creating the older man's future, which is going to have some chaos in it. But the old man <laughs> holds his tongue because he knows this is a chance for renewal. But you're, you, you, you're going to make things differently now. You're going to make that salad different. Um, and that's why the wallet, when that Wallace Stevens quote, you know, just popped out at me, I said, there it is. That 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 is what's going to be the glue for that whole poem. Um, so again, revise, revise, revise. Yeah. yeah. Um, my crow poem. Matthew Olsman uh, is a poet who has a book of epistolary poems that are letters to everything, and one of the poems is letter. Letter to the man who carved his initials in the last living pine in the Sierra Nevada or something like that. And uh, so I love the poem. Um, I was in a car with, with my husband, Gary, and we were <laughs> in the left-hand lane and a car blew past us at 60 miles an hour. And, you know, birds flying around and just boom like wrong time, wrong place and hit the crow. And the guy was the driver. It was shocking that he was going so fast down a residential road. 
Um, so the poem, so thinking about Matthew Olsman's poem and being inspired by that, I thought I'd write about this guy. Um, and initially I'm in the car and it's a little bit different. And someone in one of my workshops read it as me being on a bicycle. And so I kind of moved some of the language around so that in fact, it is I who am riding a bicycle and the guy blows past me and it's like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, um, and so that's how, that's how it started. That's, how, that's where it came from. Um, yeah. And you know, the older I get, the more I see how the animal world and the plant world are sentient beings. And um, there's some of that in there about how smart the crows are and really could. <laughs> the crow can, the crows know how to manipulate tools to get what they want. And if it's revenge, look out. So. They also remember if they yes. see a human being next to a dead crow, and that's in part of their, their murder. And they will yeah, yeah. remember whether it's a connection or not. They see the human and and the dead right. relative, and they will remember that. Well, what I was struck too by, in both the the watercress is an image of the of your of the divisions of of so many levels. It's it just is one example of all the ways the kid doesn't know you. And the crow is an example of all the ways in which we interact with nature and nature interacts with us. And I mean, it just, it's, they, they were just, they, they kind of uh, were a nice dovetail to each other. So thank you very much for them. And thank thanks you. for seeing it that way. That's, that's um, lovely. Phyllis, I, I noticed in the chat. Um, yeah, I did too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Basiliki, um, Basiliki um, had a question for me about the um, uh, Kavafi. And and yes, I, I have been reading him of late. And uh, yeah, he is, um, yeah, his, his voyeuristic poems um, do have an influence when I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> being a voyeur. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, and I think you, you're influenced by him as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I love thinking about the fact that I'm maybe I'm a direct descendant of Kavafi. Well, no, I, I wouldn't be of Kavafi, but certainly, you know, I think of the ancient Greeks, and mm -hmm. um, I'm a big admirer of Kavafi. His work is very different, but I have written a couple of poems where I um, try to be as spare and cool as he is. Mm -hmm. um, with some of his language. He writes in a kind of Greek that's very, very old that I'm not very familiar with. And so I don't quite, I can't quite get at it, but I do like, mm -hmm. I do like reading it. Um, and sometimes I do this fun thing, like if I'm, tr if I'm sort of like in the middle of a writing session and I can't think of anything to write, <laughs> I'll pull out Kavafi and I'll, with my Greek English dictionary, I'll read the Greek poem. And then I'll try to translate it. And it's hilarious what comes out. <laughs> oh, that's really, yeah, that's really um, cool. I was yeah. actually, yeah. So Peter has a question just in just a minute. Um, I was going to ask you if you ever write in Greek, like, um, yeah. or translate anything of yours. Yeah, I was curious yeah. about that. I mean, I did when I was nine. I used to write poems in Greek to my father when I was nine, but. Oh, oh, how sweet. <laughs> yeah, but not anymore yeah so peter yeah Go well ahead. I, yeah i was curious as to whether uh you had ever been translated into greek uh anastasia um oh great no question. no i would i would love would to like see to? my poems in greek. oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, would love to see <laughs> in greek and I think they'd they'd lend themselves very well and and phyllis the piece that you read i was commenting to vasili key in the private chat that that your piece would read wonderfully in Greek, actually. Oh, <laughs> what makes you say that? Beautiful. Uh, there was just something about the, um, both the images and the cadence. I think it would just uh, lend it to the language so well. Uh, yeah, we've got 
Do we have to mute somebody? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, oh, you were saying, Peter, cool. did you finish your thought? Uh, yeah, uh, no, just that that I, 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 as I was listening to your piece, Phyllis, and also to your poetry, Anastasia, that um, yeah. I, I was just hearing some of the, the cadences and uh, some of the imagery and thought, I was trying to imagine what it would sound like in Greek. Oh, nice. <laughs> and I think it would, That's very cool. uh, your work would be lovely and uh, lovely translated. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. So let's see where we are. So, um, so uh, um, I know that you have a closing poem. Um, I don't. I don't. I know Anne does, and I. I hope Richard, you do too. I just thought maybe before we go to that, just a, a minute more on editing, because I, I think <laughs> it's such an integral part of our work as poets, and as I've experienced the two of you and. Um, and how you write, and then and then being lucky enough to be part of the editing process with you, it's um, I I don't know if there's when you say edit edit edit, um, and I think we all do it right. I mean everybody's looking back and editing. So one question is how do you know when it's done? Um, and you know let's be short on this. We could go on forever, but <laughs> um, and then and then the other question is well how do you you know. I've been trying to like take some old poems and rip them up and just do like some really different things with them. So uh, editing is on my mind, but um, any, anything you want to say about your process that um, that might be interesting and maybe helpful to others who are here I, or others I, I listening? I distinguish maybe. between uh, editing and revision oh. and re-hyphen vision is re-seeing the poem. Mm. And that means, as you just said, ripping it apart, going in from a different angle to see what happens. Yeah, um, that's that's kind of fun, really. Part of my process now, which is so wonderful, we have computers, you know, and, um, you know, uh, draft one, draft two, three, four, five, and I number them all. And sometimes when I'm up to draft 18, draft 19, and I'm banging my head against the surface of my desk, I can go back to say, okay, where was this <laughs> a week ago, a month ago, two months ago? And what, what have I been pushing too far? Um, and slowly the, 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 the poem has to remain something that's organic that is growing syllable by syllable, sound by sound, line by line, stanza by stanza. And, and that um, when it's done, it is still a breathing thing. <laughs> wow. um, mm. A little bit of Frankenstein there, I guess, you know, <laughs> piecing mm. it together and uh, making, it, making it alive. I can see Melissa really agreeing with you. <laughs> Yeah. I uh I my process is one of mm, it's interesting. So I write in a journal every day, and that sort of like gives me an idea of what's going on with me. And um I'll write some stuff and sometimes I'll try to write try to write some poetry. Um and sometimes something will stick, it'll it'll have some legs, for example. And so I'll put that's when I put it in the computer. And most of the time, it's a question of committing to it. So now it's on the computer and I do what Richard does, which is I go through version and version and version. And I like to uh, write and then put it away for a day, a week, and then come back to it <clears throat> and look at it with fresh eyes, um, move things around, uh, add things. Usually I tend to make a first draft. <laughs> They're so funny, the first drafts. <laughs> um, they really are, but it tends to be a lot of words. And so my process tends to be more one of not so much adding, except um, unless there's something missing from it, but, but more condensing and making the language tighter 
mm -mm. saying what I mean and not using more than more words than I need to. And also there's that process of like looking at looking at the verbs and looking at the nouns and saying, do I say, you know, November's wind or do I say November's cheek, for example? Um, just to use to use that example. So yeah. But I, I find that can be an endless process. That's this what point I was where sure. mm -hmm. it, rather than the the revisionary has right. to become the editor and just say, that's it. <laughs> okay. Well, full disclosure, there was stuff I changed when I was reading my poems. And I noticed you added or withdrew a couple of words when you were reading two there, Richard, because yes. I was following along in the in your and endlessly. endlessly. <laughs> it's never done. Saying, it's yeah. always just abandoned. <laughs> I no, I did. Yeah. Right. You go back and look at your book and it's like, oh my God, I want to revise half of it, right? Exactly. A lot of people say that, right? So well, you know, so, yeah. but when we write a book, what I like to tell myself, you know. I mean, I wrote some of these poems like 10 years ago. And um, and I just say to myself, you know, it was part of my process and part of my evolution, and it was the best I could do at the time. And as long as I'm always doing the best I can do at the time, then right. that's mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, hooray for that, yeah. Yeah, and you know, if you look back on it, it isn't that bad. I think we're, you know, the trite, trite but true, we're our own worst critics, really. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so let's, um, yeah, why don't we have you both um, read a poem? Richard, do you have one too? Or I do. I'll read the um, the one about the um, the pilot whales. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, great. And then, Anne, will you, you can take us out. Okay. And, um, um, this is called uh, Grinded, Grinded Drap. Grinded Drap, uh, September 12th, 2021. Um, and Grintadrap is the traditional practice in the Faroe Islands of herding pilot whales and dolphins into shallow waters where they are killed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Faroe Islands are an autonomous region of Denmark beyond Scotland on the way to uh, mm -hmm. Iceland. And um, I wrote this um, after um, a photograph um, made the international news and um, the color um, showing the the animals lined up on the shore just uh, I wrote this um, have to bear witness yeah. Grinda Drap September 12th 2021 how tidy the aftermath of slaughter how precise the tally a record 14, 28 slick hulls, black as polished onyx, streaked with white. Arrayed flank to flank, heads flopped seaward, where lances severed the blubber down through the spine. Splutter of blood from blowholes, flukes drumming the sand in refutation of the islanders' claim after they rode on their speedboats thunder for hours to herd the pot ashore that it took less than a second for each dolphin to die. And how obscenely cinematic the rubied slosh of the outgoing tide into the night, where I lie not far removed in my bed, hearing those seconds tick one into the next 1,428 times. Mm -hmm. Um, my poem is called The Day Jack Gilbert Kissed Me. <laughs> On father's birthday, I took flowers. The dirt from his grave stuck to the underside of my fingernails. I grew up on this dirt that stretches and does not end. The epitaph burnished by the blade of sun setting on the grave. The robin's red breast bigger than a Mack truck. When I turn my back, the robin turns into my poem. Well, thank you both. Thank so you, Phyllis. Being here with us, with me, and 
Thanks everybody for coming. This was, um, I think I can speak for us all that this was a, uh, um, a such a satisfying and delicious uh, reading. <laughs> so, um, so have, you know, have a safe and good tomorrow. And let's hope that, um, that uh, we can hear about some peace sometime. Yeah. Um, and I did also want to say thank you to our beloved teacher, Mark Doty, <laughs> who has given us all so much. So see you next time, yeah? Thank you.